Hello and good morning. Tine tato katoa, no mai hari mai. Welcome to day two of the Financial Services Council 2020 Conference Generations. I'll be your MC today. My name is Kirsten Young. I'm the Regional Manager of Astron Life and I'm delighted to be hosting all of you out there in our digital world. Uh, made by the sector and for the sector, the conference has something for everyone, starting with our three concurrent breakfast sessions. You have three options. The first, workplace savings, in conversation with Andrew Baskant, kindly supported by Denton's Kensington Swan. Your second option, trustees and supervisors, agile supervision, lessons from a global pandemic in partnership with Trustees Corporation Association. And your third option, professional advice, get in shape, the next bite of the apple, kindly supported by Chatswood Consulting. If you have any questions about the event, please make sure you email our events at fsc.org.nz. And please enjoy the show. It's really awesome to welcome you all to the session this morning. Thank you so much for getting up for an early start on a bright and sunny day here in Auckland. Hopefully wherever you're dialing in from today is equally as stunning as it is here. So I'm really delighted to welcome on the panel with me today, Andrew Hughes, uh, Craig Manley, Peter Wells, and also Matt Band. So some of you will know these guys quite well from around the industry. For others, they may be a little bit unknown. So just a couple of quick and cheeky facts for those of you who may not know them quite as well. Uh, when you get a chance and you meet Andrew next time, ask him about living in Japan. He spent 15 years there, but please do not ask him for any lessons on how to speak Japanese. When you catch up with Peter Wells, he is your resident expert on all things apple, and I don't mean the fruit that you might eat. So ask him about how he's going on his epic collection of apple and all those things that make our lives, in theory, easier but sometimes maybe not quite so much. Um, Matt Band, well, he's got a really good surprise for you. Invite him round to the office and he may give you a hand to tie it up a wee bit. So he is the resident <laughs> neat free for the guys in the office at his work. And Craig Manley, I reckon he has to have the big kudos for this particular panel. If you're really lucky, you may actually kind of be able to catch him out one day when he's singing, hanging around on mute, having a wee sing song. So do try to give that one a bit of a crack. So today we're really here to talk about the lessons learned from going through this amazing experience of a global pandemic. I do say it is an amazing experience because I do think there were lots of things that we have learned and lots of things that are still to learn. So while we're going to kick off and really sort of get to the heart of agile supervision and what does it mean to all of us. So as a start, we'll start talking about what are the changes that we've seen in our individual workplaces and what have we done really to think about where we go for the future. So Andrew, I might hand off to you to lead us off on that discussion. Well, konnichiwa, Sharon, and thank you very much. That exhausts, <laughs> exhausts my Japanese. Um, look, I guess what, what we found out was that flexible working worked um, and we'd, we'd had that in place for a while here at PT, but this was the first time we'd tested it on mass and, and it really did work as I think most people across the industry found. Um, we had the technology in place to support it, uh, which was equally important. Um, I think the only tweak we needed to make was in a few cases, um, some of our teams, we needed to um, take larger monitors for them to work from, but hard, um, you know, carrying out the custody function from a laptop. So we had to um, sort that out. Um, but you know, the IT part, the IT team came to the party and, and did a great job on that. Um, I guess the other learning was, I think we all found out uh, there was some product out there called Zoom, which um, some of us had never heard of before, but it uh, saved our bacon kind of on, on multiple occasions. Um, I guess the, the other great learning was that our, our BCP plans were fully tested and, uh, and, and worked. Um, so I don't think our experience was necessarily that much different from other financial service providers, but I guess that was our learnings at PT, Sharon. Awesome. Peter, how about I hand over to you and you can tell us a little bit about what was going on in your world. Sure, Sharon. Um, look, we had a very similar experience uh, to Andrew at PT. Um, we we do quite a lot of field work in our, our work, so we were already set up with uh, equipment for remote working, um, things like laptops and tablets and, and IP telephony, that kind of thing had already been um, deployed and in use. I guess the, the challenge for us was really scaling that out uh, and making that 
uh, taking that from used for short bursts of, of on-site monitoring and occasional working from home, scaling it up to have everybody doing it at, at one time and doing that for a sustained period. So um, we we found, uh, with the help of a great IT team, that that um, and a couple of uh, mass working remote working tests that we did in the weeks just prior to the lockdown, that uh, we were in pretty good shape, um, and that the technology did scale up. Uh, pretty well for us. Um, we also, um, similar to 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 the uh, the Zoom experience, we deployed Microsoft Teams right at the beginning of the first lockdown, and uh, without any kind of training or um, explanation of, of what the features were, we basically just had to pick that tool up and figure out how to use it, how to get the best out of it on the fly. And I think that worked really well as well. It just uh, really quick uh, adoption curve, really steep adoption curve on that. Um, I think the other thing that, that we learned more broadly in terms of, of approach was we swung into command and control pretty quickly um, and uh, set up a, a central um, committee pretty quickly to coordinate our external response. And I think uh, whilst it wasn't a really big learning, I think it really underpinned the fact that we had a high degree of trust and confidence in our people. Um, so we were able to triage things, we were able to make really quick decisions and we were able to task a lot of virtual teams really quickly and really enable them uh, and give them uh, the autonomy, empowering them to be actual you know, to be able to actually execute and do things really, really quickly in an agile way. So I think that was, uh, if not a learning, it really just underpinned for us the importance of having that high degree of trust and confidence in your people so that when the chips are down and you really need to act quickly and decisively, you've got people who can rally around and actually get things done right. So uh, that's what we found. Thanks, Sharon. That's brilliant. You know, that trust and confidence in people is one of the things I think that we can kind of put down as a positive of coming out of this overall experience as you know as a workforce we really did have to come together in different ways and more meaningful ways than maybe we had to in the past um, Matt I might hand over to you and in answering the question it'd also be great to really think about the expanse of what supervisors really do cover so we quite often at least from my perspective get used to thinking about supervisors in the context of just managed investment schemes but you know clearly across the board you're doing much more so thinking about the breadth of what you cover as well how did you get ready for managing that slightly differently too? Yeah, thanks, Sharon, and good morning, everybody. Um, so, uh, you know, clearly our experience is probably very similar to, to the FMA and public trust. Um, you know, we initially looked at this as being a business continuity event um, for, for maybe a few weeks, um, but ultimately it became a business as usual um, event, you know, after we were all locked down for three months or so. Um, we had installed Microsoft Teams um, in February, so um, that was rolled out across the business, and, and for us that, um, that was gold um, during lockdown. Uh, with everybody working from home. Um, all our business critical applications and tools were in the cloud. So being able to move from a, a, a work environment to a home environment um, for everybody was reasonably seamless. Um, we didn't see any um, drop in productivity or, or downtime as a result of doing that. Um, and we're largely in a, in a paper environment, a paperless environment. So again, that made the working from home seamless. Um, as a business, we uh, have had a pandemic planning guide, um, which we um, enacted in late February. So we set up a crisis management team uh, where we were meeting five days a week during level four and level three lockdown. And then into level two, that was um, that was less frequent and around three days a week. Uh, and then it sort of rolled off uh, as we got down to level one. Um, what was interesting for us is that we had a flexible working policy in place already in the business, but um, this hadn't been widely taken up by staff prior to lockdown, but I guess once staff had got confidence of working from home for a period of time, then um, it was interesting is that once we got back to work um, in June, more people were, were taking up the opportunities to work from home as well. So now we have most of our corporate trust team working from home um, a couple of days a week. Another interesting thing was um, there was quite a predominant increase in online training sessions um, during lockdown as well. So there was greater participation from staff and in, um, into those online training sessions as well. Um, and I think that's a positive for, for us as a business and also for our clients if, if we've got staff um, actively participating in, in more online training sessions. So um, just on your, your second part of your question, Sharon, um, trustees, executors, um, supervisors, a wide range of um, 
clients outside of MIS. So we have uh, non-bank deposit takers, um, we have debt clients, we have retirement villages, as well as the managed investment schemes um, and the KiwiSaver and managed fund space. Um, so obviously the initial challenge for everybody in this, in this time was to ensure continuity of service. So what we were really interested in is what our clients would, were doing and how well they might have been prepared for a lockdown. Um, you know, we made inquiries around their BCP and cybersecurity and whether they were prepared to go into lockdown. Um, what were the options for them for working from home? You know, did their staff have the adequate means to work from home? Um, you know, were the custom service teams prepared to um, for the level investor inquiry that, that might be coming their way? And we saw, obviously, um, with the drop-off of markets, um, people were, were, were more concerned about their investments and what they were doing for that. So we definitely saw an increase in, in calls to, to customer service teams during that period. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that the FMA has promoted a lot over um, the last 12 months is vulnerable clients. So, you know, we're making inquiries as to how our, how our um, you know, managed investment team managers or any of our clients really for that, for that matter might have been how they were going to cater for those vulnerable clients. Um, and a key one, obviously, for the managed investment schemes is in the outsourced provider space. What, you know, what were they what were the outsource providers doing to ensure that they could have a continuity of service um, for unit pricing, processing withdrawals, you know, applications and the like. Um, we saw increased engagement with the regulators as well from the non-bank deposit taker side. We had increased engagement with the Reserve Bank um, and the FMA as well. You know, we, we started out having weekly calls with the FMA and, and um, now we're back into a a more business as usual environment. We're seeing, you know, we're having those on a, a monthly basis now. Um, for the mortgage trust and non-bank deposit takers, um, liquidity and, and asset quality was a real focus for us as well. Um, we implemented weekly reporting um, for those clients um, so we could just get a gauge of any trends that might be happening in that space. Um, for our retirement villagers, understanding what plans and um, they had in place if any of the residents contracted COVID uh, and what support operators had for the more uh, vulnerable residents um, in their own retirement village community. Another one was, was AGMs. Yeah, we had some clients who had retirement village AGMs coming up. How would they be managed? Um, the Retirement Villages Association were really interested in um, you know, what, the, what the supervisors were doing there. Um, we had one coming up in May and one coming up in June. One of those ended up being done remotely and one was able to be postponed and held in person later on in, the, um, in June after lockdown. So I think overall we were really pleased with, with how we saw you know, our clients preparedness for a lockdown and we didn't see um, a great downturn in business or any major issues that arose during that period with those clients. That's so brilliant. That's, that's really that's how we saw it. Brilliant. Very long-winded. <laughs> that's really brilliant. I think what it's done is given people a real breadth of everything that was going on. Sometimes I think we can get really uh, fixated on what we see in our own world and we stop to really think about the breadth outside of that. So Craig, yeah. I'll just hand over to you to just wrap up your thoughts on, and again, what happened through that. From you, I think you're carrying a little bit of a different perspective coming at it from running a lot of those ops functions through this time as well. Yeah, I guess, um, look, we've kind of touched on two main points here. One is the supervision team being kind of enabled so they can continue with their tasks and make sure they're actually servicing the industry, which Matt touched on. And then we've also talked about the technology. And another key aspect that we also really focused on, and we were really fortunate because, you know, there was a telegraphing of this. We'd seen lockdowns occurring around the world. So we kind of looked at this in advance, was supporting the team, both, you know, from a mental health perspective and also just from a general capacity perspective. So whilst we had, and I think Peter alluded to it as well, whilst we had people, the ability to work from home, actually scaling that up so we should continue and the staff felt enabled and, you know, felt really empowered to do that. Um, and didn't feel isolated was quite a big challenge. And as I say, we were quite com we were quite fortunate to have that kind of leeway coming into it, that, that, that telegraphing. So we did quite a bit of work around policies and procedures and making sure people were comfortable with that transition. Because it was at the same time, you know, to Matt's point, a tremendous amount of work coming through in terms of, um, you know, being, being at the pump and actually trying to assist providers as much as possible. So and I know everyone did this, but there was a real focus actually on staff and on staff's health as well. I and mean, everyone was going through that same, same event, feeling those same pressures. So it was a very unusual time. It's hard to actually think back to exactly what that was like, but it was pretty unusual. So yeah. It's awesome. So actually, what I might do is just sort of break with a little bit of a tradition. We've already had a, a question come in and it really does go, I think, to, to where we've started and also where we're going. Uh, the question that's come through is, how tough has 2020 been already for 
the sector for the for, really for the trustee sector. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to start off there, Sharon. Um, it's been quite a uh, uh, you know for for us and and for everybody, it's been quite a, a difficult year. Um, you know, to think we're now middle of October and we locked down in middle of March, it's gone very quickly. I think um, one of the reasons for that is that, you know, as, as Craig just pointed out, it was, it was pretty busy and it was pretty full on in that, in that time. Um, and you just got on with it really more than anything. And um, I, I don't think our supervision changed markedly um, despite the fact that people were working from home in fact I think our interactions and, and um, working with the with our clients probably increased more than anything um, and I think that was appreciated um, by, by the clients as well as that we were able to you know work beside them as a as a partner and an advisor and and sort of give them some direction and guidance on on how to how to handle certain things. Actually, mate, you know, you raise a really great point, and I think this kind of goes to the heart of what we're talking about really today. So what does Agile supervision really mean, and what does it mean to you? Well, actually, uh, it's, that's a good, good question, Sharon. Um, you know, from a supervisor's point of view, I think um, being agile is something that we, we, we need to be mindful of and aware of um, every, every day of the week. It's just not something that, that happens within COVID. Um, you know, we need to move quickly and take immediate action to deal with particular situations all the time. Um, the difference with COVID was that it provided a new, unique situation for supervisors, um, you know, as I've already said, is that it affected all clients across all of sectors all at the same time. So, um, you know, generally we might be dealing with a particular specific client issue or a sector issue, um, and that's very much in isolation from what might be happening across their other other clients, but you know, with COVID, um, we had to be agile across all of the different parts of our business. Um, you know, from a from a normal day to day point of view, um, you know, we we're always reacting to what providers might want um, in, in regarding making changes to their schemes. You know, it could be anything from simple stuff like document changes around deeds and PDS and SIPOs, um, or it could be dealing with errors. Or, or breaches, either trust deed or legislative breaches. So in these situations, really time is of the essence in, in most cases. Um, you know, if there's been a, a, a unit pricing error in, one of a, uh, error in one of our schemes, then that needs to be remedied quickly and, and um, investors being put back in the position they were before the error occurred. And, and, and something like that um, needs to be done reasonably quickly. Um, as I, I talked about in our mortgage trust and non-bank deposit taker sector, you know, that the, the um, are quite high risk sectors for us. Um, so introducing risk-based reporting when we need to, if we see any trends developing there that we need to monitor or keep an eye on. Um, dealing with waivers or consents um, on, on debt appointments as well. Um, and you know, one of the more recent example was the, the NZX disruption um, and supervisors need to make a decision for the managers on what closing price to use on a particular day. Um, and there was a little bit of conjecture whether, you know, I think the, the market had a full day and closed on a Wednesday, and then there was some trading again on the Thursday, but it was only a part of the day. So the question of the supervisors was, you know, what what price should we use? You know, do we use the Wednesday closing price or do we use the Thursday closing price? So, you know, they're the sort of um, situations we are constantly faced with um, and, and have to deal with. Um, you know, and you're making a, a decision reasonably quickly, um, you know, assessing risks and making a decision that's, that's in the best interest of investors. So, you know, yeah. faster action means implementation is required can occur a lot quicker for the benefit of, of all stakeholders. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Matt. Andrew, what we might ask you to do is just give us your thoughts on what do you think, do you think there are actually any, any limitations that would prevent supervisors from moving to an even more agile mindset? Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, agile kind of means different things to different people. I think we look at it from the point of view of being nimble and responsive. Um, and sometimes that's being proactive and sometimes it's being reactive in the sense of responding quickly. I, th I think, as, as Matt alluded to, to situations as they arise. Um, but in terms of proactive supervision, and I think um, uh, Peter will talk to this, you know, agility is a necessary, um, uh, is an absolute necessity if we're going to move to a pro proactive supervision model or if we're, if we're supervising proactively. I think what needs to be true, and hence if it's not true, then it's a limitation, is that you need particularly competent, well-trained staff 
you need a supervisor that is uh, engaged and proactive, um, and you need clear guidance and support from the regulators. And I think if those things are missing, then it's much more difficult to be responsive and nimble. Um, so I guess the limitations, uh, just to reiterate the same, are really, you know, if you don't have well-trained, competent staff, if you don't have clear guidance around some of these key issues, it's pretty hard to be nimble and responsive. Brilliant, that's, that's fantastic. Craig, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share? I think overall, the, the, the role of the supervisors in New Zealand, the way that it's set out, I mean, there's some prescriptive requirements, but there's actually very broad duties that we have in terms of acting in an investor's best interest that essentially embed us into the supervisor, into the manager's processes so much that we're involved in day-to-day -day processes, we're involved in documentation, you know, we're involved in monitoring compliance. It, it's really you know, a fundamental part of, of, of what we do and how we engage with them in terms of, of, of looking after the investor's best interest. And I think that means that we fundamentally have to be agile, and that's why the industry is starting to move towards and, and has made good progress towards this risk-based process of looking at that. And we, we need to be agile. It's a fundamental part of what we do because our obligations, our duties are so broad in order for us to be comfortable with the way we're covering those off, right? in order for us to understand the risk to investors, we need to be engaged, we need to be agile, we need to be reacting to what occurs at a point in time. And to Andrew's point and Matt's point, you absolutely need to have the right staff, but also the right methodologies as well, and the right guidance. I think that's really important. Well, that's a really good point. So when you start to talk about, I guess, you know, bringing together, I guess, the, those three things, having the right staff, the right methodologies, and the right, I guess, frame to work in, how do you go about creating that to make sure that you are really well set up for that success? Well, I think that, that required, that, that's, that's an ongoing process. And I think some of this being feedback from the FMA recently, and I think there's an ongoing process around developing what we call our risk assessment and monitoring plans and that really proactive risk-based focusing. I don't think it's anything that it never finishes. It's something that will continue to evolve and develop. I think as we become um, more engaged. Look, I think that it takes time, it takes energy and it takes effort. I think this is where the TCA will also now start to show a bit more and come through and provide some more of that guidance across supervisors because whilst we're all in silos developing those monitoring and risk assessment programs, it's now becoming really important that we also look at that a little, little bit more holistically across the industry and make sure that there is that consistency as well. Brilliant, it's fantastic. Peter, it'd be great to hear your view from, I guess, from taking it, coming in from the regulator's perspective. What does it really mean for you to be agile in the roles that you're conducting across market and whether or not you see any limitations? Sure. Um, well, look, I, we see um, agility as really being able to adapt and respond effectively to change. And as a regulator, um, by the way, it's one of our core core values um, that we operate by. And as a regulator, I guess that means that um, it, it essentially means being risk driven. It means understanding uh, the risks in the environment and marshalling what are pretty limited resources to to address the highest risks and, and being able to switch um, as you see new risks emerging or risks changing in the market. So, um, and that includes risks across the, um, the, the spectrum. It includes risks that are just over the horizon as well that are, that are out there but, but haven't yet arrived, haven't yet manifested themselves. So the challenge for us is, is really keeping the risk radar tuned. And I think, um, you know, all of the other, uh, the other people have mentioned this. It is really about keeping finger on the pulse and, and keeping the radar um, active in terms of understanding what risks there are and then focusing what is limited resources and let's face it um, having good qualified experienced staff um, they're always going to be a limited resource there's always going to be a constraint around just how much you can do so you've got to be working smart and deploying attention to the areas that are highest risk as, as well as doing all the basics right and looking after clients it is really important to to shift focus to those risk areas. I think it's really important as well when we talk about agility. I think there is already agility built into this part of the industry. Um, and that's because it has to act to operate against a backdrop of either market innovation and growth, which is great. Those are, those are the conditions we'd love to see, but they do bring change and they do bring risks or where there's a disruptive force like the pandemic that we've seen. And that's produced some risks externally that, that we all need to react to. So I think, um, the key here is really 
using those um, resources, those limited resources intelligently and pointing them at those risks and, and staying up to date, staying in touch with the risks in the environment. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Hey, just sure, can I just sort of, if you don't mind, can I just add to that? I mean, Peter, Peter made a very good point about um, being aware of what's going on. I think keeping, keeping close with clients and understanding their business and, and their strategy and what they're trying to achieve as well. So you can, you sort of know what's coming down the pipeline and being able to, to work efficiently and effectively with them, I think is, is something that's really important as well. Yeah, absolutely, totally agree. Hey, just a, a quick reminder for everybody that's uh, dialed into the seminar and watching the seminar, uh, please remember to push through your questions. What we'll do is there will be a bit of time for Q&A at the end of the session, but if we do find some questions that are coming through that we can answer in flight, we'll also do that as well. So one of the things when you know I sit back and I really reflect on our business and what we went through with the pandemic, and I think you guys have equally touched on that, we had this really massive shift on everything, getting people out, working from home, using technology in ways that we hadn't really done to a great degree, or at least to a really scaled up degree. And then as we came back off the other side and we all started to come back into offices and back into what was probably our normal type of working environment, some of the things we did kind of reverted back to what was the normal pre-pandemic. When you think about taking an agile mindset, what are you gonna do in the future to really start embedding some of those principles and start really pushing into the, the rapid way that decisions were made, the rapid way that engagement was made across the marketplace. Uh, Craig, I might hand over to you to lead off on that one. Thanks. Uh, I guess when we're looking at you know, uh, implementing, improving on the agile approach going forward, I, I look at that in three different ways. There's our own business preparedness, and I think we've already covered off the technology front and everyone's on, on that. Yeah, we've looked at ways that we work and more flexible working practices. We've looked at um, supporting people with that home working environment. And I think we're, we're, we're all kind of now at a really good point in that in that space. The key area though is obviously engagement with clients. And I think, and it's going to be a little bit repetitive, but I think it's, it, it is the heart of it, is that what we've actually really seen and what has proven is the importance of that risk-focused, principle-led supervision model. You know, we have a, a broad remit and we need to focus on the risks as they come through. We need to be agile. We need to be engaged with clients. To, to Matt's point earlier, that engagement and understanding is key. So our agility, I mean, when we're looking forward, when we're looking about how do we how do we improve and become more agile, we're looking at, well, how do we continue to embed our risk-based focus, our risk model? How do we ensure that we have those relationships? How do we ensure that we understand exactly What's occurring within, within the managers, within the providers, how that impacts the investors, what controls are there, and then we're testing, monitoring, reviewing those controls. And, and that's not just so we can say, look, we've done that. That's also so we can say that we're, we're genuinely engaged, we've got a genuine understanding, um, and that we're building it on uh, your genuine understanding as well of what's occurring. Um, and that, that's really key to us. We're also looking to build in the resilience as well, the resilience in those models, making sure that we have capacity. We're also looking building with the managers and engaging with them to make sure they have capacity as well. And all of these key areas that we see that are continue to be issues going forward. Um, you know, serious financial hardship is one that sticks out. There's also switching in other areas that may also come up in the future as well. So we kind of go with the business preparedness and engagement with our clients. And again, that comes back to the, the risk-based model and our day-to-day -day engagement as well. But then there's the supervisory or the, the industry preparedness as well. And I think if there's an area that came out of this, it's the need for the industry preparedness to probably improve. There was an area, I think, that, that showed that it needs some, some further development. It's that industry preparedness and, and coming together as an industry and communicating more, more clearly. Um, things such as serious financial hardship and other guidance and that type of thing. Um, and I think that's something that we pick up as an industry and start working through, using the TCA as a really good body to do that. I think it's starting to develop, it's starting to get uh, more engagement as well. So I think, um, yeah, engaging with them around that. Awesome. Thanks very much for that. Andrew, really interested in your thoughts in terms of how we would also look to build out better resilience and how we use that resilience to then, you know, ultimately get better outcomes for our customers. Because that's, you know, at the heart of everything we do, it comes back to getting those great outcomes for our customers. Yeah, look, I think, Sharon, you know, to your first point, I think we definitely haven't gone back to the old ways. I think what the um, pandemic um, kind of forced on us is we leapt from kind of point A to point 
to point D um, with a whole bunch of learnings you probably need to go back on um, and kind of reinforce it a little bit. But by and large, we're, we're still operating in that kind of agile frame set. And I, and, and I guess where it um, is, is most prevalent is in the, the number of quality interactions we have now with both the FMA and with our clients. So whereas yeah, we may have met quarterly, um, with the FMA, we, we now have monthly, we're having weekly meetings during during um, lockdown. Um, so I think, but that frequency of interactions has has stayed at that same level. I think it's, it's really beneficial. I think the ability to, with um, remote meetings and so forth now, to, for, for, you know, for me to parachute into um, meetings with clients uh, in other parts of the country uh, is just kind of the new normal now. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll jump into a meeting with our um, clients in Wellington. Um, I may not have done that so frequently before. Um, I guess on, on the paperless, I'm probably still the only guy in the office that prints off reams of paper, but that may just be an, an age thing. Everyone else seems to have um, adapted to the new normal pretty well. Um, so I think, you know, that those learnings, I, we're not going to go back on those. So I think they're, they're very much embedded. Um, and I think, I think you know, I'll let Peter talk that point, but I think the quality of the interactions has, with the FMA has improved out of sight uh, with us. Um, I think there's a greater awareness of risk. Um, I think what there were some great learnings out of... Um, out of the pandemic. I think a lot of those risks didn't come to fruition, but they forced us to think about the possibility that they might. Um, so I think there were some great learnings there. I think in terms of um, in terms of going forward, what we could um, could do better on um, is, and I think Craig touched on this, is, is better cooperation between the industry, the various industry groups, for example. So I think there was a lot of work done by both TCA and FSC on um, serious financial hardship work. Um, I think in some cases uh, the, the FMA and us ourselves as supervisors were both looking at the same issues at the same time. And I think if we if we can all coordinate and cooperate a little bit better, I think we can do do more um, better. You know, apply those scarce resources uh, in, in a better manner. So I think that that cooperation between the groups I think is is a learning we can take forward. Just better communication generally, um, and you know, hand on my heart, better communications with our clients, particularly our smaller clients during these times, perhaps more vulnerable. Um, clients that need a little more hand holding. Um, I think we could do that better going forward. Um, but as I say, internally, I don't think we're, we're not going to go back. We're not turning the clock back. Uh, I think there's some good learnings and we'll, we'll apply them going forward. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Matt, really interested again on, on how you think about building out resilience both uh, within kind of the, the supervisor industry, but also at a marketplace level. What are the things that we really do need to start to push into to build out better outcomes? I think just being aware of um, what what clients want or investors want um, from their providers. Um, are you talking about resilience? Are we talking about um, you know investors? Are we talking about the market general generally? Um, I, I think people have learned to become resilient through the the lockdown period. Um, one thing that we found was was making sure that we can share the workload across across the team as well. So, you know, it's very hard if you're not in an office environment um, to know who's got the, the piles of work and, and who needs assistance. So I think just the communication around that, um, you know, from a, from a, a team perspective, um, you know, knowing, um, knowing um, where where the, the workload sits is, is the big thing. You know, one of the things that we did during lockdown was have a survey, uh, a fortnightly survey across our, our business. Um, so you can see where, um, where some of the, the risks might be from the, from the wellbeing and resilience of, of the team as well. So I think that was really important. And, and what we found is that the, the, the resilience of the staff increased over that period of time that they were working from home. Um, and, and the survey results reflected that. And I think, um, as I've said, you know, there was a greater take up post lockdown of people working from home because they felt much more comfortable about doing that. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Peter, any comments from you just to wrap up, I guess, really thinking about adopting that change mindset in an agile world? Certainly, yes. I mean, uh, as Andrew said, we're, we're certainly not going back to, to pre-lockdown uh, operating mode. We've, we've carried on a lot of things that, that we started um, fairly quickly at, at the beginning of the first lockdown. And, and, um, and as Andrew mentioned, um, we, the, the regular market engagement that we had, particularly with supervisors, in fact, we'd started weekly calls with supervisors a couple of weeks before the first lockdown. Um, and that was really a model for, for outreach to other uh, other sectors that we engage with as well. And we've, we're doubling down on that. We've, we're investing more in that 
more frequent market, market engagement uh, because it, we think it's worked well for us. It's been really beneficial for us in terms of our risk view. And uh, we think it's also helped um, the supervisors and some of the other entities as well in terms of, of getting some feedback from us um, in terms of how they're doing. Um, I, I guess um, the other thing which Matt uh, did a big rundown on, uh, I think, in the first segment was really the broad perspective that lots of different sectors that supervisors are actually in charge of supervising, some of which we, as the FMA, don't directly regulate. Um, and we found that broad perspective looking across all of those sectors to be um, to be really, really important. It gave us a much wider view of the environment so um, that we could make some choices um, and, and gave us that perspective. And we put some structures in place as well where we can um, – not only do this engagement, but also capture those insights and 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 really filter those insights um, through so that we can act on them. So so that's one thing we've done. We've made a few um, smaller changes. Our monitoring approach. Um, those that have, that have been involved with us in terms of monitoring will know we do quite a bit of field work, quite a bit of on-site monitoring. We have started to adapt to adopt um, some remote monitoring where it's appropriate. We've been doing uh, monitoring of, of um, regulated entities through video conferencing and online tools and that kind of thing where it's appropriate. So, you know, we're, we're trying to work around some of the, the constraints and the new normal. Um, and we've really preserved a strong remote working capability. Um, and what that means is that, you know, we can adapt really quickly if we do go back into lockdowns, as, as has happened here in Auckland in particular. Um, but also more broadly, um, we're just working more in virtual teams um, because we're, we're connecting a lot more virtually. We found we'd be able to form a lot more virtual teams um, as well as just within the, the physical teams we have, just more consciously connecting and supporting one another. So I think those things are going to continue, um, whether we, you know, whether there is a, a, an improvement in the environment out there, I think they're going to continue. In terms of, of um, what we can work on, um, totally agree. I think communication and coordination are things, it doesn't matter what environment you're in, they can always be improved. Um, I think things went pretty well and look, there was a bit of overlap, there's a bit of duplication going on at the very early stages of the lockdown and I think that's natural because the tendency is always to over communicate rather than to, to under communicate when things are developing really rapidly. Um, but I do think that points to some better structures that we can have and, and some more coordination that we can have in the future just so we've got a bit more resilience across the industry so we're able to, to, to pick up and deal with the unknown when it does happen. Awesome, thanks for that. Uh, one of the things I think we'll move for next is just really getting to the heart of, of some, I think, of the chunky issues that particularly managed investment scheme providers and particularly those engaged in KiwiSaver found when we really did hit that lockdown. So everything that we thought we knew about performing some functions within the businesses changed quite radically and, and, and really thinking about things like you know, statutory declarations for financial hardship, you know, we're really aware of the possibility that there could be a, a significant increase in the level of these types of applications coming through and customers needing more support than they would otherwise. Uh, Matt, it'd be really great to, for you to start to ta talk us through, you know, the purpose and role of StatDex and, and what do we need to do or push into in the future for thinking about are there options to make this just slightly easier? I mean, that, that process has been around now for a large number of years, particularly around that StatDex process. Uh, do we need to really start pushing into, I guess, government to look at additional changes around that? Yeah, I, I think we do, Sharon. You know, we're looking at, you know, the statutory declaration given in KiwiSaver is under Oaths and Declarations Act of 1957. So we're talking about an act of parliament that's more than 60 years old. Um, so when you look at what, what's happened in the legislative space, space over recent years where the securities regulation has been brought into the 21st century with the Financial Markets Conduct Act. You know, more recently, we've seen changes around old acts like the Trust Act and, and the, the Privacy Act that have you know, been dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Um, I, I think something needs, similar needs to happen for, for the statutory declarations as well. You know, when this act would have been enacted in 1957, I don't you know, the, the regularity of stat declarations then is probably significantly less than, than what it is now. So um, while understanding um, the need and purpose for the statute declaration, I think, you know, it's quite clear an anti uh, antiquated piece of legislation that's not really fit for the current environment. Um, the statute declaration process can, can also be quite um, onerous and, and a source of frustration for KiwiSaver members as well when, when they're going through the process. You know, they want it to be done quickly so they can get their money out because they're quite in a, in a quite vulnerable situation. Some of them 
from a financial point of view. Um, you know, it's not unusual for us to, to get KiwiSaver hardship or early withdrawal applications of, of, of any description where the statutory declaration hasn't been completed. I think people have probably just thrown their hands up in the air and, and found it too difficult. You know, when you look at, um, in New Zealand, the list of people in, from, in which a statutory declaration can be made, it, it's quite a formidable list of people and they're not necessarily um, the types of people that your average member of the public would have access to when you're talking about notary publics and, you know, barristers and JPs and registrars of the court and that sort of thing. And I think the Australian model is somewhat more customer friendly where, you know, stat decks can be taken by a dentist or a, a nurse or a vet or, you know, someone that, that's more run of the mill that people have access to. So I, I think subject to, to relevant cons, um, consultation, you know, this is a great opportunity for us to take a look at the, the statute declaration process, um, maybe look at the changes that that were implemented during COVID and, and see if they can be put in, um, in place on a more formal and permanent basis, or, or just at least simplifying the process and making it easier for, for public, the members of the public to, to go down that statute. Absolutely. Um, totally agree. You kind of roll it back and you really think about the work that went in to reshape that process significant levels of work, it would be a real shame to kind of lose it because it really did have some brilliant outcomes for customers through that. Um, Craig, I might hand over to you to really think about uh, some things that have bubbled up or been talked about in industry now for quite a long number of years is whether or not there are some functions that would be better handled through centralisation. Yeah, thanks. Oh, I'll touch on that. Look, and I'll also just touch on the stat declarations. I know um, Chapman Tripp recently started a little letter chain out to MB, and there was feedback from MB. You know, they, they were quite adamant that they want to see the statutory declarations remain. I think they outlined some, some food board reasons around why. Um, I, I'm not sure. I think they are entirely um, kind of consistent with what actually happens in the real world. Um, or actually there is much value added there. So I think it's really important that maybe as an industry we feed back and we um, kind of question the genuine value or if there is genuine value as they see on that. Um, but it's important at this stage that we continue to accept what it is as well and also try and deal with it as best we can as an industry. And I think uh, FMA guidance at the level three and four and also some of the other stuff in the, the law society is really help, helpful there as well. Uh, and in terms of... Um, you know, the, the, the view, the idea, the approach to look about um, centralising or changing the way that the applications are dealt with. I think it's a really interesting one. I, I in, a, in a different capacity, have quite a bit to do with some of the budgeting services in New Zealand, and I have a lot of respect for them. I think they have a key role to play in building up financial capacity, capability and capacity um, within New Zealanders. However, when we look at the KiwiSaver product and the role of the providers or the managers in the KiwiSaver product and what we're trying to achieve, I think it's important to, you know, we need to look at what, what are the objectives we're trying to achieve here. Um, you know, the, the, the providers have a relationship around a retirement product. Um, there, is a, there is a valve there that releases, that releases funds if they can prove serious financial hardship. The providers themselves do not even actually assess that. The assessment comes back to the supervisors. Um, so is it more just looking to move, to move the administrative processes away or is it looking to actually create a structure where people get more assistance with financial capability and, and building that out? And if it is the latter, I mean, then how does that work? I mean, if, if we move it across to financial providers, then um, is there going to be an impact where a lot of people that come in looking for assistance, it may not be particularly relevant. A lot of, a lot of applications are based on life events, changes that occur, it's not over just a simple, a simple budgetary matter. So I think that's important. So, and then the timeliness of actually referring people down to a budget provider. Um, the quality and consistency of budget providers around New Zealand, I think would change cons cons considerably, potentially. Um, availability of budget providers. Um, so there's quite a few things there to look at in terms of, and then there's the cost as well, the cost of that budgeting provider and that service. So there's quite a few things there to look at. If, if it's just moving the administrative function, but well, there might be other ways that we could also we could create consistency and look at other ways of, you know, um, harmonising the budget the budget process that type of thing. There could be steps we could take in the existing process to address a number of those issues. Um, with that significant change, uh, is there a clear reason and is there clear objectives as to why that's better for the underlying investors in all in you know in the majority of cases? Uh, I think that's really important as well, and that's something that that will start to be looked at now. I think. 
Awesome. That's a really great thing, I think, to step into because I think, you know, when you think about kind of QSaver in particular, a lot of these types of processes are just going to grow. So as our marketplace continues to grow, as balances grow, as customers continue to grow as well, that's only going in one direction. Uh, Andrew, really interested in your view as well, sort of really thinking about things on the coordination and roles and responsibilities across supervisors and also the FMA. Uh, FSC and also TCA, there is quite a large number of bodies in the mix of everything we do. So how do we get better coordination, better visibility, and probably a little bit more transparency? Well, as to how we do it, um, Sharon, I'm not quite sure. I guess it's with the spirit of uh, spirit of cooperation. I think the um, the desire is there. I think we, uh, as I kind of touched on earlier, I think we, there's, there's a lot of um, people out there doing a lot of good work. Um, and it's just a matter of I guess making sure that we've got um, clarity between the different roles, certainly in the sense of the FMA and the supervisor. I think our, our, cl our clients sometimes don't quite understand where where each each player sits. I think we can we can all help in that education process. I think the TCA can assist, um, and I think we're actively working on this to ensure greater consistency and an approach between supervisors. Um, I think we're doing pretty well in that role, and I think we're we're, we're int introducing some practice guidelines at the moment that will ensure greater consistency. Um, between the supervisors. Um, I think F FSC and TCA can work closer on some of these uh, industry-wide issues. Um, and, and other groups like um, the, the Boutique Investment Group, which I think came out of this, you know, a, a great initiative from the industry, the um, Coro Club calls we had during lockdown, um, I, think we're, I think were invaluable and a great initiative. And um, so I think, I think that these examples came through and I think they kind of highlighted the fact that, uh, that, that the greater coordination was really a good thing. Um, for us, so look, I, I think we will see a lot more in this space. I think um, I think the desire and the commitment is there from from the various players, and uh, I think it's just a necessity. And I, I think we'll see that. Um, I'm I'm going to hark back slightly to the stack debt issue because it's kind of flavour of the of flavour of the month. Um, and, and my only couple of comments around that is, look, stat decks were kind of challenging enough for the most vulnerable prior to lockdown. They were doubly difficult during lockdown. You know, until we until some common sense prevailed around you know remote practices and so forth. So I think um, that they are definitely a handbrake. Um, one of the things, but you know, we, we do what we can, I think, as supervisors to make things a little bit easier. Under that 1957 Act, um, public trust, trust officers do have the ability to take stat decks. So we opened that up to, um, opened up all our retail officers across New Zealand to um, members of the schemes we, we look after to get stat decks done at our branches free of charge. So as soon as we were in level two, um, and if it was an essential uh, service, you know, we, we had the option of, um, of doing it earlier. Uh, we did provide that. I mean, you, you do what you can, right, to help. And I think um, I think we're all on that same page. Um, I'll, I'll probably stop there, but uh, yeah, absolutely greater coordination. Awesome, that's brilliant. Hey, there has been a question that's come in, which is really brilliant to see. The question that's come in really is, what is the areas of focus for supervisors looking forward? So taking that view out to the next 12 months or 18 months. So we have seen some thematic reviews that were being done over the last 12 months. Do we think we're going to see more volumes of those types of thematic reviews based on, I guess, what we've experienced? Um, Andrew, I might leave you on the hot seat for that one. Oh, okay. Look, look I think thematic reviews are, are a way of life. Um, I think we've kind of moved from the old um, uh, trustee slash supervisor sitting behind a desk ticking boxes when the reports come in on a quarterly basis when we get around to looking at them um, to a situation now where there's an expectation on us to do thematic reviews. I think so there, there will be more thematic reviews, but I think thematic reviews going forward will be done in a smarter fashion. Um, I don't think they always need to be done with site visits. I think Peter's touched on, you know, the, the ability to do some of the stuff remotely. Um, and I think thematic reviews will be done in a way that they will benefit uh, and will be seen to benefit um, the client as much as ourselves in terms of, of, of the learnings, um, the learnings from what we learn from the clients and the observations we make because, uh, you know, when we do a thematic review, it's not just a one client, it's across clients, and we can pick up learnings across that uh, and collectively share those learnings. So, look, I think thematic reviews going forward, um, th there's going to be more of them, but I think they will be handled in a smarter fashion, in a more focused fashion, um, and I think they'll be beneficial to the process as a whole. Brilliant. I'm sure my, I'm sure my colleagues may have a view on that as well. <laughs> I was going to well, hand it I, 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 I very much say. agree with that. I think the thematic reviews become just a fundamental part of the risk-based approach and what we're trying to achieve. Um, and it, it's important that the outcomes off those reviews should also be a benefit back to the providers themselves. We should be trying to raise the bar across the industry. We should be trying to actually get that 
uh, you know, provide feedback on best practice where possible. So it shouldn't be something that's onerous for them and then there's no benefit. It should be actually feedback coming back. It should, and then, and then it's part of our, our methodology, a process, it then should become a living thing that actually then rolls into the future as we, you know, we've identified risks, we've identified controls that we're then looking at and undershowing, making sure that they're being addressed going forward. So hopefully there's, you know, um, to each individual supervisor and their relationships, but hopefully they are showing and adding value and that'll continue in the future as well and just improve. Brilliant, that's great. Thank you so much for that, Craig. Hey, what I think we'll do is just move over. I think, you know, it's come up a little bit and I think it is something that is an emerging need as a marketplace that we get closer to and spend more time thinking about. So I know all businesses across the managed investment sector are thinking actively about vulnerable clients, vulnerable circumstances that clients may find themselves in, and those times that they may not even necessarily know that they could be heading into those vulnerable, vulnerable situations. Um, Peter, really interested in, in your views on what we need to do to think about how do we help identify those so that we can be more proactive and help our clients in much better and meaningful ways. Um, absolutely, um, Shannon. As you've touched on, I think we're trying to shift the thinking away from um, perhaps a more traditional view of vulnerable customers or vulnerable customer groups um, and kind of classifying people as vulnerable towards a much broader definition um, of, of what vulnerability really is. And it's all to do with with circumstances. And, and we put out a, a, a bit of... Um, I guess, information and guidance on this recently. Um, at the beginning of, of uh, lockdown or close to the beginning of lockdown, we put out a, a letter to CEOs in the, in the financial services industry, um, just really making sure that people were focused um, as things were developing and there were obviously broad-based impacts that, that things were developing. We also put out a, an information sheet um, shortly after that that dealt directly with vulnerability. And I think what's important about that broader definition is firstly, that you know, two things really. Firstly, it's dynamic. Um, it really, vulnerability can uh, hit quickly. Uh, it, it can hit people who perhaps have never found themselves in vulnerable circumstances before, but because of some uh, major event, suddenly find themselves um, vulnerable. They may not even know or accept that, that, that they are vulnerable and, and have uh, need for support, but, but it's a dynamic thing and it changes over time. And, and I think being tuned into the circumstances and how people might be impacted by them is one of the things in terms of understanding um, vulnerability. I think the other thing as well is that that vulnerability can really be aggravated where firms aren't taking the appropriate levels of care in terms of supporting their customers. So there is a duty of care there um, within financial services for financial services providers to, to take care of their, their, their customers, particularly when they're vulnerable. And where they're not, where they're taking care of other things, where they're, where they're looking after themselves, I guess that really aggravates and, and exaggerates um, those vulnerable circumstances that the customers may find themselves in. Um, so, you know, that that's, um, that's part of, uh, of what we've been trying to to put out there as, as a, an underlying message. I guess our approach to vulnerability, if we step back a little bit, was first of all, uh, we spent quite a lot of effort in the early stages of the lockdown um, trying to relieve regulatory burden, trying to provide regulatory relief from some of the, the more indirect compliance requirements. And that was really freeing firms up so that they could focus uh, as much of their attention and resources as possible on their customers and particularly in looking after their, their vulnerable customers. So, um, you know, the first thing we did was try to provide some, some uh, I guess, clear air, some, some opportunity and, and, and a bit of relief to, to financial services firms for them to be able to, to shift that focus. I think a few of the other things that we mentioned to them was um, we really promoted uh, operational resilience. So we wanted to make sure that those channels were open um, and that were really uh, uh, customers could get information and could get that support and access that support in a variety of different ways and, and that firms are actually shifting resources into the front line to really be available um, and, and communicate frequently and openly and, and proactively in many cases with customers. And we saw some great examples of, of um, different financial services entities out there actively looking at particular impacts that their customers may have, their particular customers may have, and looking to really tailor their response towards those impacts. So that was great. Um, and obviously, um, ensuring that 
while all of this is going on and there's a great focus on customers, that there is continuing focus on conduct management within financial services. And that is to say, uh, whilst we're, we're, we're all uh, closing ranks and focusing on customer outcomes, really important to make sure that you know the underlying delivering services, maintaining those services and delivering them responsibly and ethically um, was continuing as well under all of those stresses. Um, so, so that was our approach, and, and I guess we're, we're a little bit uh, removed from the front lines, but we tried to do what we could in terms of providing the guidance and the support. That's really great. And look, it is really great to sort of, uh, I think, get everybody's minds open to start stop thinking about uh, particular client groupings, because vulnerability is such a broad and diverse thing that people go through and and people that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be vulnerable will be we will all be vulnerable at some stage in our life for reasons that we won't necessarily see today um, everybody we're pretty much nearly at the end of the session thank you so much for, for listening and it's been really great what we might do is just do a very very quick wrap up around the teams just really thinking about the support that we gave to our staff through this process and how we'll also give them that support as we go forward I think you know resilience is a, is a really key topic how we grow in the future, but also making sure that they have the wherewithal within themselves to be able to manage. Um, Andrew, why don't I hand over to you to give that one a kick off? Sure, thanks, Sharon. Um, look, I, I think yes, staff are obviously critical um, to the whole mix. And at, at, at PT, we had a product here called PT Care where people logged in every week and basically told us how they were feeling about life in general and what their health status was. and. Um, what their travel arrangements were, so we can keep track of travel arrangements if they were meeting with uh, clients, etc. So we could do, do the contract contact trace, tracing piece. Um, we found that hugely beneficial to get that that check in with our staff regularly as to how we were doing. We had uh, regular stops for safety and team meetings. Um, they started out daily, then they moved to kind of Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Then it was kind of Tuesday, Thursday, and then it was once a week as people got more and more comfortable with working from home and and more over some of the anxieties, I guess, associated with um, with the new work environment. Um, we had, uh, at, at the senior leadership level, we had um, very regular check-ins, obviously following the government's announcements um, and, and how public trust was going to react to that. And, you know, as an essential service, we had options um, that perhaps others didn't have. And I think most of the financial services providers had those. So, so it wasn't necessarily clear cut as to what we might do at different levels. Um, and they were immediately followed by leaders calls out to all the, out to all the teams. Um, as, to, as to how we responded. Um, and we sent, and the message came from the very top um, from our CEO around do what you can when you can, um, because the challenges for a lot of our staff, especially once the school's closed, you know, and you had kids at home and, and all those additional stresses, and even worse than kids, you had those damn partners at home with you as well, hogging the kitchen table. Um, it was really a matter of um, truly flexible working. So if it made sense for you to work from you know, six in the morning through to um, through to ten, and then you know, get the kids sorted out for the day. Then then, then do that, and then work a bit later in the evening if that worked for you. Um, but basically, the message went out: do what you can when you can. And I think the staff appreciated that, and it worked. We didn't lose productivity; um, it, it worked pretty well. Actually, Craig, I might just hand over to you just to wrap this one up very quickly, given where we are on, uh, at on time. I'm really interested in running an operational team through this as well, and also going through, you know, lockdown one and then hitting lockdown two. Uh, you know, from, reflecting from our point of view, staff generally found it harder going back to that version of lockdown two. How did you support your team with that ricocheting? I think the interesting thing with lockdown two is that you know, what, when it occurred, it was very much a repetition of the same. So what we largely found is all the hard work or the stress had actually come through in the first lockdown. And when we went into the second lockdown, it was very, it was very natural. It simply occurred. It was, but it seemed it was much more of a procedural matter. There wasn't a lot of those same concerns we had going into the first one. You know, there wasn't the market turmoil, so there wasn't the additional supervisory um, elements coming through. Um, and so that made it quite a change in terms of the ease that people just simply evolved back into it. I think for a lot of people it was more stressful in other ways later on, just in terms of children and then the, the changes across the country and the different levels made it quite difficult to manage as well. But generally, like, we adopted exactly the same processes and policies and, and we had all the infrastructure set up. There was a focus on, on staff's mental health in general, um, again, flexible working, allowing staff to work within their own hours as they saw fit. Um, and it seemed to work really well. But I think the key is, is that it was very much, it was more procedural, I think. Um, and we were lucky in, in that way. There wasn't those additional market 
um, impacts coming through that were, that were changing the workload or, or the way they had to focus. So we could, in the second one, just focus on staff and focus on, you know, do what you can do, do it when you can do it, um, and, and working through that way. So it was a lot different. I think um, as we come through in the future, both through lockdowns and not lockdowns, as we see the other border impacts from COVID coming through, I think that's going to really test us again. And I think as an industry, we're, we're all aware of that. There will be, I think, you know, the next six, 12 months, much more testing time to hit. Um, and we're focusing on that at the moment in terms of how we develop and build that resilience as well. Well done. Hey, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you so much for your time today. I know that everyone that was listening in got quite a lot of it out of it. I know that I got quite a lot of out of, out of it as well. Uh, these sessions do take quite a lot to pull together and they do take quite a lot of time out of your days. So thank you all very much for that. Um, everybody listening in, if you do have any questions, I'm sure there'll be an avenue for you to fire them through. And if you do want to catch up with anyone outside of this at any stage, now you know a little bit about us all. Thanks very much, everyone. What a fantastic way to start the day. The morning sessions have covered a cross section of topics from the innovations and training for workplace savings professionals to the unparalleled challenges facing investors and the future of regulatory transition. Thanks again to our valued sponsors, Denton's Kensington Swan, Chatswood's Consulting and Partners Trustees Corporation Association for supporting these valuable industry sessions. Before we launch into the main platform of political and regulatory speakers, please take an opportunity to have a 10 minute break, have a stretch and enjoy some of the spring fresh air. We'll see you in 10. Hey, Konera.